Hi, I'm Eric Voss, and in the ashes and in the snow dust of the Battle of Winterfell, the next on Game of Thrones trailer for Season 8, Episode 4 gives us just enough clues to give us an idea of what might come next in this last war for a chair, and the insane ways the show could further twist the Valyrian steel knife in our shattered expectations. I'm gonna break down the details that you might have overlooked, and spoiler warning in case any of my predictions end up being right and they ruin your life, or if they don't end up being right, and that ruins your life too. Let's get started. We have won the Great War. Now we will win the last war. The teaser opens with plumes of smoke and flame outside the walls of Winterfell. Later in this teaser, there's a shot of what this is. Bodies of the dead stacked up with Daenerys, Sam, Grey Worm, Sansa, Jon, and Tormund carrying torches toward this pile and what looks like some kind of ceremonial funeral pyre after the battle. This would be the second funeral pyre that Danny would have to use to burn a loved one after her season one goodbye to Khal Drogo. Traditionally, the Northerners burn their dead to prevent the risk of them coming back as whites, but now that the Night King is gonzo, does burning these bodies serve a practical purpose or just a ritualistic one? I suppose it would be a lot of graves to dig, and the permafrost in that ground must be pretty sturdy. Perhaps they're still feeling superstitious that the Night King will return, or that he's not really dead since there was only one witness, a fern. Perhaps the way the previous Three-Eyed Raven passed on his title to Bran right before he passed, the Night King could have passed on his leadership of the White Walkers to another figure at the moment of his death. And some Somewhere up north, there's a little blue baby crawling his way south. So the northerners are like, we gotta burn everything just to be safe. I know, I know. This sounds like the kind of crazy crackpot tinfoil stuff that those old grouchy northerners would probably say to each other while they're burning their dead beloved family cat in front of their kids. The zombie babies come and burn it all! Now, I can't tell if that torchbearer behind Sansa is Arya or someone else. Maybe it's Alice Karstark. I just say that because it wouldn't make sense for Arya to skip this ceremony. She didn't stand with her family to greet Jon and Daenerys in the first episode of the season because she prefers to be a face in the crowd, scope out the situation before she reveals herself. And she just proved that she is way more effective in general when she stays in the shadows. The dire wolf ghost is also visible, meaning he survived what was the dumbest Dothraki cavalry charge ever. Thank the gods. There's also a shot of Cersei Lannister, apparently the last villain standing on this series, overlooking her new Golden Company in King's Landing. The Golden Company is led by Captain Strickland and they're composed of 18,000 infantry, 2,000 cavalry, which didn't seem like much before especially without the damn war elephants they were supposed to have. Where's my elephant? I'll keep asking until I get it. But now that Danny's army has whittled down to some, I don't know, rattled, unsullied, and a couple hole-filled dragons, it might be more of an even fight. Euron Greyjoy joins Cersei as she wears this new Lannister red wardrobe. Before, she wore black as the color of mourning for Tommen. But now she's back in her Lannister family colors to identify herself apart from merely being a successor to someone else. It's interesting how Cersei and Daenerys are seen in the color red this episode. Red and Crimson both are in the color scheme for both the Lannister and Targaryen sigils, but it sets them up as dual figures with the same goal, both of whom are willing to bleed into their clothes to get it. It's like two women who hate each other showing up to a party wearing the same color. It's awkward. Daenerys declares that they've won the Great War, but now they'll have to win the last war, which cuts to a shot of Danny toasting the Northerners as a cheer in victory. But there may be something screwy going on with the editing here. Danny is wearing different clothes in these two shots, and they're clearly part of different scenes. I'm thinking that Danny brought up this now onto the last war line to a smaller room, a less enthusiastic one, with like John or Davos saying, uh, sure, my queen, I I'm with you, but I don't know if you'll convince the other Northerners to help you take the Iron Throne, but you know, nothing stopping you from bringing it up to them. And then the big room victory toast, Daenerys gets some um, big cheers initially, but then she starts chanting, one more war, one more war. And then, you know, it gets awkwardly quiet. And then just to break the tension, Tormund Giantsbane slurps from that horn of milk. We'll see, let's move on to the second half. We'll rip her out root and stem. Daenerys greets Drogon, and the surrounding terrain looks significantly less snow-covered than what we saw before. There was always that theory that the White Walkers brought the season of winter with them, and that without them, winter doesn't really exist. Now, I don't know if all of the seasons of Westeros are just magic. It did still seem to be snowing after Arya killed the Night King. Maybe the White Walkers just have the power of storm from X-Men. But there definitely is some connection between the White Walkers and how cold it is. There's a quick shot of Arya smooching Gendry, and this might be the only victory 
slapping Arya does. Again, she does not want to be in the spotlight. I could see her allowing Jon or Daenerys to take credit for the Night King's death, since really it was only Branch who was there to see it, and publicly, Jon and Danny's plan was for one of them or their dragons to kill the Night King. So claiming that victory would help further either of their positions politically. Another shot shows Danny marching away sternly, perhaps reacting to the Northerners, feeling less eager to join or march south. One of those Northerners staying put is Sansa, who watches Danny's army march away from Winterfell. Remember, there must always be a Stark in Winterfell. The White Walker War being over now forces Jon and the rest to address that complicated political question that he had been avoiding. The confusions of the late Ned Umber. Who is your grace? Who is my lady? His very secretary of agriculture now. And will Jon keep secret his true lineage and support Danny, or undercut Danny and pursue his own claim to the Iron Throne? Or will he suggest that the two marry and be co-monarchs? Eh, maybe not. Yeah, I'm sure like Benioff tells Weiss that they're co-creators too. Sansa sees Daenerys' two surviving dragons flying off, and notice how Rhaegal's wings look damaged. Holes in his wings might make it really hard for him to fly straight and accurately, make him less of a fearsome weapon if they were to try to attack King's Landing. Rhaegal also soars over the Targaryen fleet. I don't know, just given those ominous shots in the opening credits of this season, showing the scorpion weapon aimed at the dragon skulls in the Red Keep, I'm feeling worried about how well Danny's dragons are gonna hold up. Euron drops down to a knee before Cersei. Maybe he's proposing marriage. Though, I'm curious to see the blowback that Euron will face for losing Yara Greyjoy, his prized prisoner, as well as a few ships of his fleet to the Iron Islands. If Yara is back there now, claiming to be queen, his rule and status as a king in his own eyes are now in question. The final shot of the teaser shows Cersei looking pretty smug, flanked by Euron in the mountain, and Daenerys' voiceover declares, We'll rip her out root and stem. Root and stem is an interesting phrase. It's been used a few times before. Last season, Arya spoke it when she was posing as Walder Frey, taunting the phrase as she killed them that they shouldn't have left one wolf alive after the Red Wedding. You should have ripped them all out, root and stem. And back in the first book, Maester Pycelle supported Robert's desire to assassinate Danny, saying, Treason is a noxious weed. It must be torn up, root and stem and seed. Who's he, Dr. Seuss? So Cersei and her late husband's failure to eradicate the entire Targaryen bloodline, root and stem, is now coming back to her in a possible day of reckoning. But you know, it also suggests that Daenerys' scorched earth dreams might be wishful thinking. Like, think about it. Root and stem, it's literal overkill. You can't erase someone from this earth. That was the Night King's goal, and he failed spectacularly. So while I would be surprised if Cersei Lannister survives this series, the seeds of her treachery will take root, and you could say they already have. Do you think the Night King could return? Or is Cersei the more interesting villain anyway? Comment down below with your thoughts, and subscribe to New Rock Stars on YouTube, and subscribe to our Game of Thrones podcast, Westeros Weekly, wherever you get your podcasts. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter, at EAVoss. I'll see you guys after I finally take a stress nap. God, I hope they don't do anything to ghosts while I'm sleeping.